Tonight we're talking about how to be led by the Spirit of God. And you know, that's a subject we could talk about for hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks, so we're just gonna hit the highlights. I'm just gonna give you some perspective. I'm just gonna believe that God's gonna have me say the things that go right into your heart, right into your mind, the things that are gonna help you tonight. Because you know, the thing about being led by the Spirit, first of all, the Spirit of God lives in us if you're born again. That alone is a let's run around the room and shout for hallelujah, right? I mean, who else is God? Puts themselves on the inside of us, nobody. This is our God. He made himself so close to us that he made his home in us. So that means the answers of the universe are in you. You don't have to go far to find them. And God wants to lead you by his spirit. I know Christians who are desperate. Oh God, oh God, please talk to me. Oh God, oh God, please lead me. He wants to. You don't have to beg him. You know, because he's got a plan for your life on this planet. It's a plan that he needs you to fulfill. And if you aren't led by him, you might not get in the plan. You might not do the plan right. How many know he wants to lead you every day? in big decisions and small, in big directions and small. He wants to tell you the right way to drive to work every day. Plus, that follow the plan for your life. You know, should you move to Cleveland or should you marry that person or should you spend that money or whatever. He wants to lead you every step of the way. Why? Because he has a plan and he wants you in it. So the first step to knowing how to be led by the Spirit of God, he's, he's not trying to make it complicated. He's not trying to make it hard. It's not a big secret. He's not hiding anything from you. He's hiding things for you. And he wants you in his plan, right? He wants you to hear his voice. And so the first key to knowing how to be led by the Spirit is to know that he wants to. To know that he wants to lead you. So we're going to look into the word and kind of prove that tonight. We're going to get some faith for that tonight that he leads you by his spirit. You hear the voice of God, okay? And so we have to start with Jeremiah 29, 11. You've heard it before. See, God has a blueprint for your life from the beginning. Since before you were just a twinkle in your mommy and daddy's eye, God had a plan for you. And Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Some of the versions say plans for good and not for evil. Duh. God's plan for you is good. I love this verse. It tells us certain things. It tells us, first of all, there is a plan. How many are glad? You're not here by random. You're not, you're here on purpose. There is a plan for you, and somebody knows what it is. <laughs> Yay, right? I have Christians approach me all the time who say things like, if God would just tell me what to do, I would do it. Right? Well, there is a plan, and he knows what it is. So it makes sense, of course, to go to him when you're looking for answers to the plan. Don't ask other people. You know how we ask little children, what do you want to be when you grow up? I really think we should stop asking them that. I think we should ask them, what does God want you to be when you grow up? Because he's gonna use all their gifts and all their talents and they're gonna be the most happy when they're walking in his perfect plan. So he knows the plan he has for you and they are a good, it's a good plan. God's plan for your life is good. You know, I used to teach at Rhema, and I would have students sitting in my office, especially towards graduation time, you know, and they would say things like, I think God is calling me to go back to my home church, but I'm just not going. I'm like, okay, so what you're saying is, God's plan is for you to go back to your home church, but you plan to get out of the plan. Let me know how that works for you. Dumb. You know, sometimes we think we know more than God because that doesn't sound like a good idea to us. You know, God's plan is to go here, to do this, to be with that person, to, to hang out with them, to take that job, to, to, to take your neighbor a pie. 
And you're like, oh, bad idea, God. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to take them a pie. Do you know their dog pooped in my yard? <laughs> so we don't do what God leads us to do because we think we know better. We don't. Some of you can write that down. If you remember nothing else I said tonight, remember, God is smarter than you. So his plan is a good plan. And so as we are led by his spirit in his plan, it's for our benefit. It's for our joy. It's for our peace. It's to be where we're supposed to be. You know, I pray every morning, Father, put me in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing. Make me a blessing today. If you're in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing, it's going to be a good day. You're going to be in the plan. You're going to be led by his spirit. So we know there's a plan. We know it's a good plan. We know that God knows the plan. Okay? And then Ephesians 2.10, he tells us this. <clears throat> Let's see. Ephesians. Yep, right there. He says, for we are his workmanship. And some versions there say masterpiece. You are his masterpiece. He worked on you and framed you and gave you giftings and gave you strengths and made you his own. He made you his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Everybody say, I was created for good works. I was created for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So plan, right? It's already made it's already done you've been framed and made to do this to be this to follow god be led by his spirit and get into the plan right and you know sometimes i think we think that god is not into the details you know why doesn't he tell me what to do why isn't he paying is he paying attention you know because sometimes people ask god i need abc and god answers you well then do xyz and you're like, are you paying attention, God? That's not what I was asking you. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anybody? <laughs> That's happened to me before. You know, I'll say, now, God, uh, you know, uh, I, I need you to, for favor on this job. And he says, give $500 to them. I'm like, are you paying attention? I need favor over here. He's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I'm paying attention. Do this. God is into the details. And when he leads you by his spirit to do a certain thing, sometimes it sounds wacky to you. You think, what does this have to do with that? But I'm telling you, he knows the way that you should go. And so when you're led by his spirit, you listen to his voice, and you have to understand he's into the details. You know, I used to teach on uh, Blood Covenant and Old Testament survey, and we talked about the tabernacle in the wilderness. Now, I don't know if you've ever read about the tabernacle in the wilderness in the Old Testament, but it's kind of good bedtime reading because... It can get a little involved. You know, sometimes I'm reading and I'm like, Lord, I don't care how long the curtain was and what color it was and where it had to be placed. But all you have to do is read about the tabernacle to realize God is into the details. Every one of those details. In, and now, this tabernacle, you understand, was temporary. It was a tent. It was movable. And it wasn't even going to be the final tabernacle, even the final temple where the Spirit of God dwelt. It was just temporary while they were supposed to travel in the wilderness for just a few days to make it to the promised land. We all know that they had to travel for 40 years, so they used it longer than they expected. But if God put that much detail into a temporary structure, how much more is he into the details of your life? He's into the details. He's paying attention. You can trust him. When he speaks something to you, and we're, talking, we're still talking about being led by the Spirit. When he speaks something to you and you feel like, gosh, I think God wants me to do this, but it doesn't make sense. It's not what I asked him. It's not what I expected. How many? <laughs> Hello. Life with God, right? Does anything ever look like you expected it to look? Not me. Everything looks different than I thought it would. So I've kind of been with him long enough now to know that it's not maybe going to look like I expect. I'm going to do like he says because he's into the details. Think about Matthew chapter 10. I believe it's verse uh, 30. He, ta he says, the very hairs on your head are numbered. This verse freaks me out. 
In fact, I tell people, if you're in a relationship with somebody who's counting the hairs on your head, run for your life. That's obsession. <laughs> and not only that, but tonight when I was getting ready to come here, I like ran a comb through my hair and some fell out. So I'm thinking he must be keeping a running count of all the hairs on my head, and not just my head, but yours, and not just everybody in this room, but everybody in Minnesota, and not just everybody in Minnesota, but everybody in America, and not just everybody in America, but everybody in the world. Seven billion heads every minute of every day. Does that freak anybody else out? You know, just in case you were wondering if God was into the details. I think he can keep track of stuff. I think he knows that much about you. So when he leads you, you can trust him. When, he, when you get that little inkling, that little feeling on the inside, I think God wants me to do this. I'm always surprised by Christians who say, but I don't want to. Who cares if you want to or not? Do it. You know, and as you learn these things, you learn to be led in the small things, he's going to give you more and more, and you're going to practice in the small and get the big, but you have to realize he wants to lead you. We're going to look at some scriptures here in the Old Testament, just to give you some faith for the fact that God has always been a guide to his people. Under the Old Covenant, which is not as good as yours, and under the new, he is a guide. He is, he wants to lead his people. It's been his purpose since the very beginning. So let's look in Isaiah chapter 42, 16. He says, and I will bring the blind by a way that they know not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. I love that verse. He knows that, you know, as he's leading you in his plan for your life, as he's guiding you and speaking to you and you're learning to listen and be led by his spirit, he knows the way and you don't. You know, we humans, we're kind of scared of things we don't know. Like this way is unfamiliar to me. I don't know what to do, so I don't want to go. God knows that you don't know where to go. He knows that you've never been down this path before. And, but he says... I will lead you. I've been to your future and back. I've been down this path before. You can trust me. I will lead. You are blinded right now. Because he said, I will lead the blind. He doesn't mean people without physical sight. He means you can't see the next step. How many know humans sometimes don't obey God because they can't see the next step, so they just don't take any steps? But God says, if you'll, lead, if you'll let me lead you, I'll take you down. I know that you don't know the way, but I do. Right? So I'll lead the way, the blind by a way they know not. I'll lead them in paths that they have not known, and I'll make the darkness light before them. When he tells you to take some steps, it's dark to you, the next two or three steps. You know, we humans, we kind of want, could you give me all 500 steps, God? And the answer is no. He's never going to give you all 500 steps. He's going to give you one. Why? Because he wants you to depend on him. And besides, if he showed you what's 500 steps down the road, you might freak out. You know, I know after my first husband passed away, I was friends with several other widows who went on to carry on in ministry, you know, and one of them said to me, why didn't God tell us this was going to happen? I said, because we would have run screaming from the planet. <laughs> you know, there's some things you're better off not knowing yet. He wants you to try. He has grace for every day. You know, it's, it's easy to look down the road two weeks and go, man, if that happens, I don't know what I'm going to do. When you get there, you'll have grace for it. Don't panic now. Right? This is all about being led by his spirit, trusting his leading, knowing he wants to lead you. He will guide you. He sees the future. He's on it. He's making the darkness light for you. He promised it here in, in Isaiah 42, right? And he'll do these things and not forsake you. God is not one of those who will take you part way down the path and then go, okay, I brought you far enough now. Go on. Hope it turns out for you. Aren't you glad? No, he's never going to forsake you. He's going to walk with you all the way to the end. Thank God. You're never going to have to do any of this without him. 
Okay, and then in Isaiah 48, 17, let's look at that. He said, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Everybody say, he leads me the way I should go. Aren't you glad? This is God's promise to you. He is your guide. He does lead us. How do we be led by the Holy Spirit? We listen and we follow. We understand he wants to lead us. He said so right here in his word. He leads you by the way he should go. Some of us need to write that down on a sticky note, put it on our mirror and go, he is leading me. He is leading me. I do know the way to go because he is leading me. He's a sure guide, and he lives right on the inside of you. In um, Psalm 32, 8, he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. How many know the eye of God can see everything? He sees in the spirit realm. He sees everything in your future. When he guides you with his eye, you're seeing some stuff. He's not blind, you're blind, but he's not. You're with the guy who knows which way to go. You can trust him to lead you. And listen, if you're facing some kind of major decision in your life, or you're wondering, you know, what is God's direction for me? Or you're like, I wish I could hear the voice of God. You need to write these verses down and keep saying them to yourself. They are promises to you. He is leading me. He has promised to lead me. Um, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of God. My steps are ordered of God. I walk in, in the right direction because God is leading me. See, this is what faith says. Faith says what God says. No matter what you see, no matter how many times you've blown it before, no matter how much you don't know where you're going, faith says what God says, he is leading me. He'll never forsake me. My steps are ordered, okay? So that's what faith says. I, uh, Psalm 48, 14 says, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Now this does not mean he's going to guide you into death. <laughs> that means, it means until you die. In other words, back to that, he's never gonna forsake you. He's going to be your guide all the way through to the end. How many are glad? He's never going to give up on you. He's never going to stop part way and say, you know, swim, baby, swim. Hope that works out for you. He's not going to say that. He's going to be your guide even until death. Doesn't mean he's going to kill you. It means until you die, until you fulfill your time here on the earth. And so in the new covenant, that's just old covenant. That's just the, the inferior old one. <laughs> Our covenant is better. Now he's put his guide on the inside of us. We don't even have to go anywhere Hallelujah. to hear the voice of God, to be led by the Spirit of God. Look at John 16, 13. It says, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, and he has come already, right? This is looking back on this. He will guide you into all truth. Everybody say that. He is guiding me into all truth. He is guiding me into all truth. See, didn't you just feel good just saying it? Yes. yes, hallelujah. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. Now, don't misunderstand. He's probably not going to show you the whole plan to come. My experience with this has been he'll give you little vignettes, little snippets, you know what I mean? Like back, you know, my first husband died when I was 37 years old and I was 17 years single. And then I married my wonderful husband, Bob. Everybody say, hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. <laughs> but 17 years is a long time. And how many know the devil came along in between those times and said, nobody wants you, you're ugly, it's over for you, you're never gonna get married. Because that's what he does. Steal, kill, destroy, lie. That's right. You know. And so, but you know what's funny is the Holy Spirit like this verse says, who showed me things to come. And every once in a while, I would just get little snippets of being married. It's not like I could see the face of who I was being married to. It was just a knowing in my spirit 
one day it'll look like this, Karen, and you'll be married. Just little snippets, not the whole plan, how to get there, how to meet him, what he looked like, none of that, <laughs> but just those little snippets. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It's one of the way he leads us to keep going, to keep believing, to keep trying. You know, I, during my single years, I knew a lot of single people and they were funny to me. They would believe real strong for a spouse and then they would stop saying, "Never mind, I'm fine. I can get along without somebody. <laughs> and you know why they did that is because they were disappointed or discouraged that it had been taken too long. And so they, it was kind of a self-protective kind of a thing. So they'd pick it up in faith and then they'd drop it. And then they'd pick it up and then they'd drop it. That takes longer. <laughs> In case you wondered, it takes longer when you do it that way. It's better to just pick it up and say, Lord, keep showing me things to come. I'm believing you. You're leading and guiding me. You, you know the desires of my heart. You're answering my prayers. I believe you. And then in Romans 8, 14, he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons slash daughters of God. You could say, the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. How many children of God I got in the place tonight? Woo, -hoo. Woo -hoo. you know what that means? You are led by the Spirit of God. You need to start saying that about yourself. I am led by the Spirit of God. It says so right here in Romans 8, 14. This is how to be led by the Spirit. Believe what God has said about you. In John 10, well, let's look at it because it's kind of, I've got several verses here in John 10. This is where Jesus is talking about sheep. Everybody say, bah. Yeah, remember, you're his sheep. He's talking to you here. In John 10, in verse four, it's in red in my Bible. That means Jesus is saying it. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Everybody say, I know his voice. See, now what happens to Christians is, you know, you talk about being led by the spirit of God and they don't feel like they've been led by the spirit of God and they start saying things like, I'm not led by the spirit of God or I can't hear God, or why doesn't God talk to me, or God's not talking to me. Just keep smiling, nobody will know it's you. We need to say what God says. What did he just say? You hear his voice, right? Thank God, and it says, verse five, even better news, yet they will by no means follow a stranger or a devil, right? but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Whose voice do we follow? The shepherd. Right. Now, of all the names that Jesus has really, if you think about it in the New Testament, he's a healer, isn't he? We could call him healer. We could call him Lord. We could call him savior. But the only name he calls himself in the New Testament is shepherd. Everybody say, bah. <laughs> <laughs> he is your shepherd. And so this is you he's talking about in John 10. You hear his voice. You need to, some of you, if you're just, you know, you might be hearing me say that and you're going, yeah, but he doesn't talk to me. Yeah, but he doesn't talk to me. Start saying, I hear his voice. I hear his voice because the word says so. And then in verse 27 of John 10, it says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Just in case you missed it the first time. He's reiterating what he means. You are his sheep, you hear his voice, and you follow him. You don't go the wrong way, you go the right way. You don't listen to a stranger, you listen to him. You are led by the Spirit of God. You hear his direction. Isn't that just the best news ever? And so I wanna just talk tonight about a few ways. I actually have a book called How to Make the Right Decision Every Time. Uh, pretty audacious title, but again, I think I've said it before, but who buys a book called How to Make the Right Decision Every Once in a While? <laughs> Nobody, right? And it says 10 keys for finding God's direction. You could say 10 keys for how to be led by the Spirit, okay? And so I'm gonna talk about a few of those keys tonight. If you want more or you wanna take it home and meditate on it, this book is in the back on sale. I mean, for sale, and then there's a CD as well, called Getting God's Direction for Your Life. But so I'm gonna talk just about a few things. You know, I wrote this book because again, 
I used to get a whole bunch of students in my office at Rama, especially at graduation time, who are just sort of panicking. You know, it's like, it's almost time to graduate. Now what do I do? Right? I'm looking for God's direction. I, I want to hear his voice. I want to know what he wants me to do next. Again, they would say, I got the, the phrase from them, if God would just tell me what to do, I would do it. Right? And what I find is that most Christians want to do what God wants them to do, but they're just not sure what those steps are. They're not sure how to be led. They're not sure how to find his direction. So I wrote them down. And so this is kind of a handbook for finding God's direction. And you know, the, there's 10 keys and, and, and they're all important, but the first one is the most important. The first one to being led by the spirit, the first one to finding God's direction is determined to be led by God and nothing else. Determined to be led by God and nothing else. Now, when you're sitting in church on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or whatever, and you think, oh, yes, amen, hallelujah. I'm only ever going to be led by God and nothing else. But let's be real. In real life, out there, sometimes we're tempted to be led by other things. For example, money. Money has a really loud voice and can talk to you, and you're tempted, not you, People sometimes are tempted to be led by money. I'll give you an example. Say you don't like your job. It's not meeting your needs. You don't, you know, you don't like the people you work with. It's not using your skills. You're looking for another job. And say you get a job offer from Cleveland, Ohio, and they're going to pay you three times more money than you're making now. And it's utilizing all your skills and giftings. It's something you've always wanted to do. They're going to pay for you to move there. They're going to give you a car to drive around. And you're like, yes, cha-ching, I'm taking it. <laughs> but really, if we're going to decide to be led by God and nothing else, what's the first thing we should do when we get that job offer? Prayer closet, right? Yeah. Father, is this your plan for me? Do you want me to take this job? It sounds good. And listen, God wants to prosper you. Don't misunderstand me. He absolutely wants to prosper you, and he will if you do it his way, right? Because I'm telling you, all the money in the world is not going to make you happy if you're out of the plan, if Cleveland isn't the plan for you, right? And so we, if we decide to be led by God and not by money, the first thing we do is ask God about that job. And he might say, yes, that's it. It's for me. Take it. <laughs> but he might say no. And then you have to decide, am I going to believe him or am I going to believe money? Just keep smiling. We've all done it, right? Sometimes we're tempted to be led by lack of money, this was me. I'm telling you, when my first husband and I were in ministry, we were so broke we couldn't afford to pay attention. I mean, we, I made decisions based on lack of money all the time. Because I just had, you know, we said prosperity words, but <laughs> we lived lack life. And I just want to tell you that you should keep saying prosperity words because eventually you'll see them in your life. The word absolutely does work. Okay, but at first, we were just struggling along, and God would say something to me like, you know, I want you to give this amount of money to them. And my first thought was, I can't afford it. So I'm not being led, am I? I'm not going to give them the money because I think, well, I've got this bill and that bill and this bill and that bill. If I, pay, if I give that money, then I won't have. Just like Pastor Paul said, if God's asking you to give, why is that? Because he's trying to multiply something to you and get something back to you. But I let money decide things for me, or my lack of money in those days. I don't do that anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But that's just a couple examples of other things that we let make decisions for us besides God. What about the opinions of other people? Sometimes we let people's opinions decide things for us, don't we? Either they're negative opinions or they're positive ones. You know, maybe your mama doesn't want you to move to Cleveland. And you ask your mama if you should move to Cleveland. You know, sometimes people have agendas. God has no agenda except for your benefit. That's it. He's the only one you know who has no agenda except blessing. And so when you decide to be led by him and not what other people think, or what'll so-and-so say, we, it's easy to be 
influenced by what other people will think. And yet God says, don't let that decide for you. Don't be led by what other people think of you. Well, what what will they think if I do this and what will they think if I do that? That cannot be your final word on it. Decide to be led by God and nothing else. You know, what about a pro-con list? (laughs) Now, I'm a famous list maker, okay? And I, I'm kind of fond of the pro-con list. And you know, like when, I, when my first husband died and I pastored our church for a while in Boise, Idaho, I'd been going about four years pastoring by myself and all of a sudden I started to feel like God was saying, move back to Tulsa. Give up the church and move back to Tulsa. And I'm like, God, have you ever been to Tulsa? <laughs> I've been there twice now. And this makes it look like I don't know where I'm supposed to live. Come on, God. Really? Tulsa again? This would be three times that God wanted me to move to Tulsa. So I argued with him, which is not ever a very good idea. And I made a pro-con list. Okay? Now, my pro-con list read sort of like this. Pro, moving to Tulsa, God said to. Con, moving to Tulsa, I don't want to. It's hot in the summer. It's ugly. I'm moving away from my family. I'm moving away from my friends. And the con list went long, okay? And the pro list was like, God said so. You know, and maybe there's some connections there. I don't know, (laughs) right? If I had gone by the pro-con list, Con would have won. And I wouldn't have moved back to Tulsa, and I would not have become a RAM instructor, and my kids would not have gone to ORU, the first Christian school they ever got to go to, and I wouldn't have, you know, I mean, on and on and on. I wouldn't have met the people who got me my first book contract and a, a million other things, right? I would have been out of God's will to stay in my cushy life in Boise, Idaho, if I'd stayed, if I'd decided according to the pro con list. See, our heads want to make a pro-con list. We do. Because we know so much, right? <laughs> we know so much. You do not know what the future looks like. God does. Don't be tempted. You know, you know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And we go, oh, yes, amen, hallelujah. I trust the Lord with all my heart. And don't lean to your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will lead you. Your understanding is so limited. And so be careful of the pro-con list. It looked kind of dumb to me to move back to Tulsa for the third time. And I was having those, what are people gonna say? Ah, see, I'm tempted to be led by other things besides the spirit of God. The most important key to being led by the Spirit of God is decide to be led by God and nothing else. And don't do anything until you know he's leading you. I always say, if it's God today, it'll be God next week. You know, sometimes we're led by pressure. You know, pressure. I do not respond to pressure at well. You know how you go to like an appliance store and they say, if you do not buy this fridge today, it's off sale and you have to have it today. And and otherwise I can't make any guarantees that it'll still be here tomorrow. Because salesmen know that if you walk out the door, their chances of you buying it are much less than if they can convince you right there when you're in the store. But I just don't respond to pressure at all. But sometimes we do things quick just to get the pressure off of us, right? Don't be led by pressure. Don't be led by your understanding. Determine to be led by God and nothing else. In that appliance store, if God has that fridge for me, you know what? It will still be there tomorrow. And it'll still be there next week. And if you try to pressure me, I might go to the other, other one, other appliance store. You know, I, I like to say that the devil, only the devil uses pressure. God leads us. He does not ever pressure you. Not ever. So don't be led by pressure. Don't be led by your understanding of things. Take the time to seek God. You know the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. I love that story. And there's so many things I've learned from it. It's only about three verses long, but it's just the best story ever. Because here's Martha. (laughs) Trying to make so much happen in her own strength. Can I get a witness? 
right? And I'm determined to be led by God and not my own strength, right? And you see in this story what happens, Martha is in the kitchen trying to get dinner together and thank God for the Marthas of this world or we'd all be hungry, right? <laughs> but she goes running, she's stressing. You can tell because she runs into her living room and yells at the Lord. You know you're stressed when you yell at the Lord. <laughs> And she says, make my sister help me. I mean, that is just the funniest thing to say to Jesus. I just think, I wish I was there. I hope we get to see the video in heaven. Because really, she, can you imagine? She's in Jesus' face. Jesus, you make my sister help me. I love that. Anyway, and he says, and she totally thinks he's going to say, yeah, Mary, get in the, in the kitchen and help your sister. She totally thinks she's in the right. Totally. We've all been there, right? And Jesus says to her, no, no, Martha. One thing is needful here. One thing, and Mary's doing it, and you're not, sister. What's Mary doing? She's sitting at his feet, listening to him for guidance, listening to him for help, listening to him for peace. And Martha's not doing that. And when we try to you know, make decisions based on other things and on the pressure and our understanding. We try to be led by so many other things. We miss what God has. Listen to this. You know, when Jesus went to Mary Martha's house for dinner, it wasn't too many verses before that that he just multiplied food, a tiny loaves and fishes for 5,000 people or 10,000 people or however many people were there, Right? And Martha's all trying to make this happen herself. What if she missed her multiplication miracle by trying in the arm of the flesh to make things happen? What if she just sat down at the feet of Jesus like Mary and Jesus might say, you got a loaf? And he could have made dinner for everybody right there. We don't want to lean to our own understanding. We want to make decisions based on God and nothing else. Remember, because we know he wants to lead us. We know we hear his voice. We know he knows our future. So we have to back up and do like Mary did. Jesus said, one thing is needful. Beep, 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 beep. Back that truck on up, sister, and park it at the feet of Jesus until you know what he wants you to do. Because remember, he wants you to know what it is. And so don't move, don't decide, don't take a direction until you know that you know that it's his direction. And he'll give you a little help along the way. Of course he will. But don't get in a hurry. Don't get pressured. You know, it's only the devil that says, the devil's favorite, one of his favorite lines is, you know, you have to decide right now this is your only chance. And if, you, if this window closes, no more chances for you. Liar. Lie your pants on fire forever. God is the God of a chance and another chance and another chance and another chance, right? It, it, my, my spiritual father used to say, it's easier to play catch up than clean up. You know, it's better to be a little behind and just catch up than to go too fast, too ahead of God, not being sure, being led by something else, and then having to clean up the mess. Moving to Cleveland and then having to move back, right? You know, it's better to go back if you're wrong, for sure. Don't let pride keep you in the wrong place, for sure, for sure. But wouldn't it have been better not to make the wrong decision in the first place? To take your time and do the one thing that Jesus said is needful. He absolutely wants you to hear his voice. He absolutely Put his spirit on the inside of you. You know, you were made to hear his voice. You were re, I should say you were remade because born again people are the ones who hear his voice. Now, of course, God can talk to anybody and has, but, he, but for Christians, for new creatures, we are made to be led by his spirit. We are created to hear the voice of our father, the voice of the spirit of God right on the inside of us. And so, that is such a blessing, such a gift. The one who knows everything lives in you and wants to lead and guide you. Another thing, another key to being led by the Spirit is watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. We've kind of alluded to this already, but you know how your mama used to say, watch your mouth. It means you either just said something that you're going to get in trouble for, or you're fixing to say something that you're going to get in trouble for. 
right? And, and God says a lot about our words. You know Mark eleven twenty three, 23, right? It says you can have whatever you say. What have you been saying? Right. Just keep smiling. Yeah. It's always good to kind of rehearse and revisit your own words. Have I been saying, God never talks to me. Why doesn't God talk to me? If God would only tell me what to do, I would do it. I can't hear the spirit of God. I can't hear the voice of God. Why isn't he talking to me? Stop saying that. Say what God says. He says God is leading you. You do hear his voice. He's leading. He won't forsake you, right? All those scriptures that we read, he's in you. You, you absolutely are meant to be led by the spirit of God. Start saying, I am led by the spirit of God. Agree with the Bible. You know, Romans 4, 17 is talking about Abraham in Romans 4, and it's saying that God called him a father of many nations before he was a father of anything. And, it's, and, the, and the, what it says in verse 17, for God calls those things that be not as though they were. That's a huge principle of faith for us, especially when it comes to being led by the Spirit. It's call yourself led before you feel led before you look led, right? Call yourself healed before you feel healed. Call those things that be not. Ask yourself, what be's not yet in my life? You know, I teach on parenting a lot, and I, and I teach on helping your children be obedient because that is their one commandment for God, from God in Ephesians 6.1, children obey your parents. God's smart. He knew that children had short attention spans. He just gave them one commandment for 18 years. <laughs> Obey your parents. Right? But instead, we, and so we're, our job as parents is to help kids obey that one commandment. That's it. We're not getting them to obey us so that we look good, although we do end up looking good if they obey us. But really, we're doing it to help them fulfill the one, plan, uh, the one, the one commandment on their life. But, but what happens is parents say things like, you never listen to me, you don't obey me, why don't you listen better? Your room is always messy, you're so messy, you're so, right? We say what we see, just keep smiling. God says, say what you don't see yet. Call those things that be not as though they were. Start saying, you're so obedient, I'm so glad you listen. My, you're getting tidier every day. It sounds crazy because they don't look like that yet. Right? Same with healing. Because the Bible says you're healed, you should say you're healed. Call those things that be not as though they were. And then it becomes that. Right? But it feels funny because you don't feel good. And so why would I say I'm healed when I'm clearly sick? Because God says to. He says you're clearly healed because Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, took your infirmities, bore your sicknesses, and by his stripes you were healed. So we say... What God says, even though we don't see it yet, we call those things that be not as though they were. So maybe you're not feeling led by God right now. You know, how to be led by, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And people feel, well, I, I don't hear the voice of God. I don't feel led by the Holy Spirit. Stop saying that and start calling those things that be not as though they are. I am led by the Holy Spirit. I do hear his voice. A stranger's voice I will not follow. He is leading me by the way that I should go. See, watch your mouth. Start saying what God says. You know, when my youngest son was graduating from ORU, a whole bunch of people would come up to him like they always do when you're about to graduate and say, what are you gonna do after you graduate? What are you gonna do after you graduate? And of course, he didn't know what he was gonna do. So the pressure, he's feeling the pressure, right? And he's praying to believe to know what to do, but he doesn't know. And so people would ask him, what are you gonna do after you graduate? And he would say, I don't know. And he would say, mom, that really bugs me. I don't wanna say I don't know because I'm believing to know. So one day he said, I came up with the answer. When, when they ask me that from now, I'm gonna say, I'll know when the time comes. I thought, that'll work. Good job, dude. He was calling those things that be not yet as though they were. Because he didn't want to keep saying, I don't know, while he's believing to want to know. Right? So he started saying, I'll know when the time comes. And he ended up getting hired by ORU and became a recruiter for them. And so it all worked out great. It happened just the way he was believing it. But that's why we have to watch 
what we're saying, line up what we're saying with these verses that we've read tonight. No, I do hear his voice. He is leading and guiding me. He does have a good plan for me. I am his masterpiece, right? And he wants to lead and guide you. Another way, another key to being led by the Holy Spirit is what I like to call try it on. Try it on. You ever, you ever go by a, a, a clothing store and see a really cute outfit on a mannequin and think, ooh, I'm going to buy that. But then you try it on, which I would recommend you totally always should. You try it on and somehow it just doesn't look the same on you that it did on the mannequin. And you're like, oh, thank God I didn't just buy this without trying it on. Right? Because sometimes we need to try things on. In other words, I like to say, give the Holy Spirit something to witness to. Take a step in the direction of, uh, we'll go back to moving to Cleveland, okay? So you're praying and you're saying, Lord, I'm not going to move unless I hear from you. I'm not going to move to Cleveland just because the money's so good, okay? But I'm going to try that on. And sometimes all I do when I'm trying something on is I just say, I'm moving to Cleveland. And then I check my spirit. How does that feel? You know? Brother Hagin used to say, you'd either get that smooth, velvety feeling or you'd get eh, 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 in your spirit. What do you do when you're checking with the guide on the inside, Right? And so I'll, sometimes I'll just do that. Okay, I'm going to move to Cleveland. How's that feel? And if you don't get a no, then try on something else. Uh, start looking online at real estate in Cleveland. And then check and see how that feel. Right? We're, still, we're not going by outside things. We're still being led by our spirits, right? But we're trying it on. We're taking some steps. And maybe you don't get a no when you're looking at real estate. So then you take a little trip. To Cleveland, spy out the land. That's scriptural, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just like the 10 spies, 12 spies. And so then you go to Cleveland. And as you're walking around downtown Cleveland, you're going, well, Lord, what do we think? This happened to my first husband and I when we lived, when he was still in school in Tulsa, uh, about to graduate from Ramah, we felt like maybe he was telling us to go to Boise, Idaho and pastor. And so we took a trip to Boise because his family was from there. And we're walking around going, Lord, is this the right place? Should we go here? And it turned out that wasn't the time. We didn't go there yet. We went there later. But we're, we're going there. We're seeing it. We're trying it on. We're seeing how it feels. Not, not feels, but feels. <laughs> Does that make sense? And you know, the more you do this, the more you understand. I've, I've felt some things in my spirit long ago and kind of been wrong about it. You know, you kind of sometimes have to practice. But it's all right. You're still looking to the guide on the inside. You're still listening for that still small voice from God. And so, you know, you either, Brother Hagin used to say, you try it on and you keep taking steps towards it, either till you get a no or till you're there. Pretty easy, huh? Try it on. But again, we're checking with God all the time. That one needful thing. We're taking time with God. And, you know, when I say take time with God, I mean read your Bible, pray. Pray in the spirit, hallelujah for praying in the spirit, praying out mysteries, things you don't know yet, right? And so these are the ways, just some of the ways that God leads us. That there's more in the book, but I'm not going to go into them all tonight. I'm going to kind of let you go because here in Minneapolis, it's going to start snowing. We all want to get home before that happens, right? So, so let me just say this. There's only two ways to get out of the plan of God. Sometimes we humans get so scared to make any kind of a decision or any kind of a move that we get paralyzed and we don't do anything because we're afraid to make the wrong decision. And maybe we've made some wrong decisions. Hello. <laughs> In our past, I'm, everybody has, okay? So don't think you're the only one. And that, but that makes us a little maybe gun shy to make another decision, you know, or to think we are led by the Spirit of God. But there's really only two ways you can get out of the will of God. It first is, you know he told you to do something. You're sure he told you to do it, and you won't do it. Like, you know, like my student who wouldn't go back to his home church. I know God's telling me to go back there, but I just don't want to go. Let me know how that works out for you. That's out of God's will. The other thing is, if he told you not to do something, and you know he told you not to do it, and bless God, you're going to do it anyway. That happens a lot in, like, relationship things. I get women, I used to get women in my office all the time who were like, but I love him. 
I don't think that God's, he's the one that God has for me, but I love him, and it might be my last chance, so I'm going to go ahead and marry him anyway. <laughs> I have never, ever, ever, not even once heard those words and had it turn out good. Not even once. Because on purpose, they're getting out of God's will. Okay, so those are the only two ways to get out of God's will. You know he told you to do something and you won't do it, or you know he told you not to, but you really, 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 really want to do so you did it anyway. Those are both out of his will. The rest is just us trying to hear from him and walk in his will. He can do anything with a heart that says, Father, I wanna hear your voice. I wanna walk in the right direction. Please help me. Or if I'm, and you know, you know, when I, when that time when I had to move from Boise, Idaho back to Tulsa, I was kind of scared to do it because I was making the decision all by myself. You know, my first husband died and I took over the church. That sort of happened to me. But this was me making a major decision to move my whole family. What if I was wrong? Ah! And God said something to me that was so sweet. He said, Karen, even if you're wrong, which you're not, I'm big enough to get you back on track. And he is big enough. He can do anything with a heart that's saying, Father, I just want to hear your voice. I just want to be in your plan. Please lead me. If I get off, lead me back. Right? You, you can't get out of his will with the right heart. It's only having the wrong heart that's going to get you in trouble. The, the stubbornness of not doing what he said or doing what he didn't say. All right? All right? 